factors influencing sequential bilingual development. I see it all the time in my graduate students here at TC. They may have been monolingual speakers of Spanish or Mandarin or Cantonese or one, another language, and then they come here and they start English, or they start kindergarten at five, and they lose all their L1. When they come to Teachers College, the speech pathology program, it's very clear that if you're a bilingual speech language pathologist or a bilingual psychologist whew, or a bilingual ed evaluator, you're going to have a much, much, uh, many more opportunities for employment because bilingualism is so important and they're, they kick themselves <laughs> and their parents sometimes for not maintaining that L1 and now they're working hard to get back that L1 because they had significant language loss. Now let's think about language loss and what happens in language loss because this is something really important when you're evaluating children. When, you, when a child goes into a preschool and the teacher speaks English and, every, and a lot of the kids only speak English and the English they learn pretty quickly is the language of power and money and their family wants them to learn English and they start to in that classroom and all of a sudden they don't want to speak their L1 which might be say Spanish. They don't speak Spanish or Haitian Creole. They don't care if their parents are speaking it. They don't care if their aunts and uncles are speaking it. They want to be part of the new generation at three. I've seen it at three with kids who supposedly had a disability in one of those preschools for kids with disabilities. And so what they do, they reject their L1. Part of it is sociocultural, meaning a choice made because they're learning the value of English for them, this is what they're inferring, and they forget, they, they see that Spanish or their L1 may be the language of the poor, the language of immigrants, the language of the past, the language of their parents, and they reject it and lose, so they will refuse sometimes to speak it, their L1, and they'll only speak, want to speak English. So evaluators go in, they go, okay, now I'm a bilingual evaluator. Boy, he, has, he won't speak Spanish to me, he won't speak Haitian Creole to me, he won't speak Mandarin to me. Ah, oh, he doesn't have those skills. Problem in that assumption. Then you go, ah, and when I look, work, look at his English skills, they're very, very delayed. He doesn't understand the story. I give him directions. He doesn't do that. I ask him colors. He doesn't know. He doesn't know a lot of stuff. So you have English skills emerging. The L1, because the lack of use may be in this process of loss or attrition, and then what happens is, as evaluators, we say, well, I'm taking my photograph of where that child is, and it looks like that child has a disability. In fact, again, that child may or may not have a disability, but unless the evaluator can find out the information needed to make that differentiation between normal process of second language acquisition of a typically developing child going through language loss and that's a, a different child who has a disability going through language loss. That evaluator can't make an accurate identification. Children are exposed to code switching as well, um, back and forth. Many families, the, the way they speak to each other is code switching. So they may not speak only Haitian Creole or only English, English with the older parents, I mean Haitian Creole with the older ones, English with the young ones. They may actually mix them together. And uh, when I was in Ghana in January, I actually have a, an interesting video of um, uh, two, one is 22 and one is 17, a brother and sister, speaking, code switching English, Ghanaian, Patois, Chui, and Ga. And it's the most beautiful thing to see. And there's rules about code switching. One of my uh, colleagues, Donna Valenti, has looked at when children with disorders miss switch at inappropriate times when they're code switching. How are you going to know that? If you're a native code switcher, a native code switcher, and you're, you can make that determination. It doesn't sound right. Then there are effective variables, which we talked about with um, the silent period. One is, are these people, want, do they want to become part of the culture? Do they want to give up their culture? Is it something they want to walk away from? or something they want to maintain and hold strong. Their personality, I described my daughter's, uh, my ex-husband, my daughter's father. He was somebody who was going to hold on till he got it right. And there's a lot of people like that. I'm more of a person that will make the mistakes and learn by my mistakes in that way. It's just personality. And then what's your learning style? You know, so I 
would carry around a dictionary and that turned out to be not the most effective way because I was using my English. So then I started to I started just studying Spanish to try to get it. Let me give you some of the research. There's a lot of research that we have out there that we're not really looking at and this would apply to educational evaluators, speech language pathologists, and psych evaluators because we all look at very very similar things one of the issues that happens is we're all looking at the same thing why torture the child that way anyway we know from paradis who's a researcher in canada that the syntax and morphology of children going through subtractive bilingualism which is that language loss that i talked about looks has the same characteristics as the most common disorder of language in preschool children, which is specific language impairment. So here we have the research from Paradis that says, you know what? Language loss looks exactly like language impairment. Looks exactly like it in terms of syntax and morphology. And yet, ed evaluators, speech evaluators, and psychologists, if you don't bring that knowledge base in to make that differential determination, and I'll show you how today, um, you all you're doing is misidentifying children. What does New York State policy says? And uh, I'll show you, we showed a lot of state policy on day one. Here's some, it, it's amazing to me how, um, how on the ball New York State Education Department policy has been for over 20 years. So here's what New York State says. Language data is essential to distinguishing characteristics associated with the normal second language acquisition process and those associated with a specific language disorder. Now the Paradis research that I showed you was 2005. But this, from 1990, New York State policy said you got to differentiate second language acquisition from a language disorder. Back then, over 20 years ago, we had, we're not doing it. None of the tests currently, or I would wager 100 bucks, yeah, 100 bucks, that in, in the future, in your lifetimes, we will never have a test that can make this distinction. That's what I wager. People will work on it, but to really have a test that's going to be able to make that distinction, I wager we will never have that. Currently, we definitely don't. So if you've done any evaluations and identified a bilingual child as having a disorder, looking at syntax and morphology that they say run or they didn't, you know, they have losses in L1 and, and English, guess what? You have not made a distinction from a point of really having the skills to do that. And our 4410 preschool, so here the kids come up from AI. A lot of them only get services in English. At three, they're put in a preschool for kids with disabilities. Who knows if they have it? But those 4410 preschools, for the most part, are alternate interim bilingual placement classes, meaning you got a teacher who speaks only English, and then you got a couple of assistants, teaching assistants, who speak the child's L1. But for the most part, what the amount of same, I've worked in a lot of Spanish um, alternate interim bilingual placement classrooms, and the teacher is speaking in English, and basically what the children are here in Spanish is, callate, pon atención, siéntate. That's basically it. That's not a lot of Spanish, right? And so what's going on, and a lot of the teaching assistants speak English because they're not, they don't usually get the training to know how to use their L1, the L1 of the children in the classroom. So what happens is the children, even if they arrive, they hadn't gotten any AI, they arrive, they're three years old or four years old, they've been in an all L1 environment, monolingual, Spanish speakers, monolingual Haitian Creole, monolingual um, Mandarin, ma monolingual Hindi, monolingual Punjabi, whatever. They arrive and what happens? They start to lose their L1. They were at that preschool from 7.30 in the morning when they got on the bus to 2.30 or 3 in the afternoon when they got dropped off. And some of them stay later in those added times. So they start losing their L1, the English starts emerging, and we say, oh my gosh, of course they have a disability. Look at this. And what happens is the L1 continues to drop, the English continues to emerge, and every year they have a problem. Again, it's a problem of the, of the evaluator. So how many children going through subtractive bilingualism have been misidentified as a child with a speech and language disability or a child with a language problem by the psychologist 
or a child with an expressive problem by the Ed Evaluator. Way too many.